Welcome everyone uh, to today's seminar hosted by the Transnational Legal History Group, uh, part of the Center for Comparative and Transnational Law here at CUHK Law. Uh, today, today's uh, seminar will be on the subject of Hong Kong as historical crucible of refugee and migration crises and governance. Our presenter today is Dr. Christopher Shabla, uh, who we are immensely fortunate to have with us. Dr. Shabla is joining us from across town, uh, where he is a global academic fellow at the University of Hong Kong. By way of very brief uh, background, uh, he has published academic work or has work forthcoming in the Berkeley Journal of International Law, the Melbourne Journal of International Law, Law and History Review, and Oxford University Press. Uh, in addition to his time at HKU, he has been a visiting fellow with the Global Migration Center of the Graduate Institute Geneva, and he is a member of the Emerging Scholars Network at the Calder Center for International Refugee Law at the University of New South Wales. I happen to know he's practiced and researched in, in many other uh, jurisdictions around the world uh, as well that would be too lengthy to enumerate here. Uh, what I can say um, uh, in short is that there are few academics today with more voluminous knowledge about international migration uh, law and practice. So it's an immense uh, privilege uh, and honor to be able to hear from him speak uh, on this subject uh, tonight. So by way of brief procedural uh, overview of uh, uh, tonight's or today's talk, uh, Dr. Shabla will speak for around 45 minutes. After that, we will open up the floor to questions and discussion. Uh, if you have any questions during the talk, please send them in to me using the chat feature on Zoom, uh, and I will then read them out or perhaps simply unmute you uh, so you can read the question yourself during the concluding question and answer session. The aim of this seminar, like all of our seminars, is very much to generate dialogue uh, and discussion. Uh, so please do, uh, don't hesitate to send me in your question if you do have one. Uh, let me also note, it's always the case with Zoom, it's a little bit more difficult because we're distanced to get the conversation flowing. So um, there's often a lot of questions that come flooding in at the end. If you want to make sure or you know, give your question a better chance of getting in there, um, shoot it to me early uh, and that should help. Uh, for everyone's information, let me note this event will be recorded and posted uh, and shared on the center's website following the event. So if you want to uh, re-watch it uh, or share it with colleagues, it will before long be available there as well. Uh, okay, so without uh, further ado, uh, let me hand over the floor uh, to uh, today's uh, speaker, uh, Dr. Shabla, uh, the floor is yours. Thanks so much, Chris. Um, uh, as I was saying before, I'm, I'm very sorry that I um, wasn't able to uh, be at CUHK and see uh, all of you in person, but I'm floored that over 120 of you have come to, to see this talk. I'm deeply grateful for your presence. So let me just share my screen to begin. Um, I'm not sure why. Okay. If everyone, hopefully you can see this. If not, let me know. Um, so just to begin, uh, I wanted to provide a bit of an overview about what I'm going to be speaking about today. Um, so what I want to focus on is the fact that Hong Kong's post-war history demonstrates some of the key divergences and convergences uh, between refugee and migration governance at the international level that continue to have consequences today. And I'm going to be speaking uh, in particular about two migration crises that have affected Hong Kong's post-war history, the Chinese migration crisis early in the post-war period, and then the, the Vietnamese so-called boat people crisis that happened uh, much later on beginning in the 1970s. Um, what I want to show really is how international law and global governance uh, intersected with these so-called crises, demonstrating uh, the, these frameworks of international and global governance biases uh, and their shifting priorities, but also by doing so, try to place Hong Kong at the center of migration history and at the center of international law and global governance. So instead of seeing it simply as a place that sort of received what was going on, what was being framed in New York and Geneva and these places where international law and global governance tended to emerge from, see it as a generative site 
where some of the ways uh, that global governance and international law function today really emerged from to begin with. So placing it at the, at the center of this. Um, but to do this, um, sort of want to, to zoom out a little bit uh, and to provide some, some background. So um, the first question I want to address is where did this post-war split between these ideas of refugee and migrant come from to begin with? So there were, there were different concepts of refugee and migrant that existed in the interwar period, the period between the First and Second World Wars. Um, uh, but refugees were defined much differently than they are today. Uh, different national, ethno-national groups uh, or religious groups could be designated specifically as refugees. Um, and migrants were thought of as, as those who, who fell into the category that did not include these. But in the 1940s, in the course of the Second World War and after, there was a sort of... Uh, uh, blending of these categories um, into the category of, of displaced persons, which included more than those who would be uh, considered a refugee, anyone who was sort of dislocated in the world. Um, uh, but this again unwound, and there was a reassertion in the post-war period of the idea of refugee as a separate uh, juridical category uh, in the early 1950s, in part because uh, the problems of the Second World War were seen to be uh, winding up, uh, in part because the Cold War seemed to be imposing uh, new realities. So what did this look like? Very famously, uh, the definition of a refugee that exists um, primarily today uh, emerges from uh, the UN Refugee Convention uh, that was uh, uh, brought in in 1951. Um, and it focuses on the idea of a refugee as someone who is persecuted for one of uh, several uh, very discrete reasons and categories. So persecuted for their race, religion, nationality, membership uh, of a particular social group, a particular opinion, um, and a number of other um, germane um, uh, uh, factors that I'm going to touch on uh, later. Um, namely the fact that a refugee is considered to be someone who is outside the country of his, of his or, you know, of course we can substitute uh, uh, his or her or, or other or gender category nationality uh, or and is unable to uh, avail uh, him or her, et cetera, itself of the protection of that country. Um, and this is also uh, inscribed into the mandate of UNHCR, the UN High Commission uh, for Refugees, the principal international agency concerned with refugees in the statute of that organization. Although um, the mandate of UNHCR importantly could be expanded beyond this. Um, through relevant uh, general assembly resolutions in the UN, uh, which is a function of the fact that UNHCR is of course a UN organization and tied overall uh, to the broader United Nations. So anyone who um, doesn't necessarily fall into the category of refugee, and I'm gonna talk about how this category could be expanded in different ways, but sort of the residual category of, of those who don't fall into this definition can be thought of as migrants in other ways. And so the question is, um, what is the international legal and, and organizational framework that deals with these people? So in the early 1950s, um, there was an attempt to frame an organization akin to UNHCR for migrants uh, as well. So the International Labor Organization, the ILO, had been sort of attempting to frame this kind of organization to bring it under its aegis in the interwar period. And they, they again, in the 1950s, uh, proposed an international migration administration that uh, will function in, in a similar kind of way as a kind of UNHCR uh, for migrants as well. Um, this is rejected, however, uh, by the United States, uh, which would have been the principal funder of the organization. Um, it's been suggested that it's rejected for, for Cold War reasons. Um, the idea that uh, would have been um, something that would have been controlled by the Soviet Union to a significant extent and that, and that the United States, although it could abide by this uh, with regard to the smaller number of people who would fall under the definition of refugee, couldn't for the larger number uh, of, of people who would uh, be considered migrants. However, um, one of the things that I've, I've sort of uh, discovered in my research is that um, other states um, were concerned for different reasons uh, that such an organization um, would include um, uh, that such an organization um, uh, could come into existence uh, and be concerned with uh, a large number of migrants um, outside, uh, particularly of Europe, um, uh, for various reasons, but uh, importantly because 
uh, they were concerned with the idea that non-European migrants might uh, impact um, their sovereignty. In, in other words, be immigrants into Europe that um, they would find undesirable. So as a consequence uh, of these developments, in 1951 to two, um, a sort of US-friendly camp of states, so uh, Western European states, the US, uh, Canada, some states in Latin America and Australia, come together and form an organization that is not wholly international, not linked to the UN or the ILO uh, or, or any sort of larger international assemblage, uh, but is sort of um, just grouped within this camp of states um, called the uh, Intergovernmental Committee for European Migration specifically. So it's going to be concerned principally with European immigrants, um, and it's going to uh, be a kind of small group that um, is, has a discrete membership. So as a consequence of this, um, we have a refugee regime that's primarily uh, folded into the United Nations, uh, that has a clear relationship between uh, the Refugee Convention and uh, UNHCR, the organization that's concerned uh, with refugees worldwide. Um, uh, the UNHCR uh, is, is empowered to sort of uh, look over the, the monitoring of refugee rights under the convention, promote the Refugee Convention, for example, um, and it itself is monitored by the UN General Assembly. Uh, the migration regime becomes more fragmented. So you still have the ILO kind of producing migrant rights conventions, and to some extent, the UN is involved in this as well. But then you also have uh, ISIM as a sort of a UNHCR equivalent, which is, of course, not linked to the UN, not linked to the ILO in the same way that UNHCR is linked to the UN. Um, beyond this, of course, um, we have the, the sort of wider human rights regime that can apply to both refugees and migrants. But a lot of these rights and a lot of the instruments uh, that are concerned with them uh, don't really uh, come into play um, until much later in the post-war period. Very famously, sort of the, the paradigm of human rights activism that we're more familiar with today only really starts in, in the 1970s. And some of these in instruments, for example, the ICCPR, uh, don't really start to be ratified into that period as well. So uh, for a long period of time in the post-war era, uh, a lot of these instruments were not necessarily as relevant uh, to, to migrant rights and to refugee rights as, as they have become uh, today. But I'll, I'll come back to this and address this a little bit later when we, when we reach uh, closer to this period of the talk. Um, what I want to do now is to try to, to look to some extent um, at how these regimes impact Hong Kong. But to do that, we need to think through uh, the extent to which uh, they were primarily concerned with uh, Europeans versus non-Europeans, which is not only something that impacted the migration regime actually, but um, actually is something that uh, is, is an issue for the refugee regime as well. So um, while there was this kind of split in how these regimes were organized early on, uh, both of them are still primarily concerned with Europeans. So under the Refugee Convention, for example, uh, there is a restriction on uh, the time in which one could be a refugee. So it's said that if one uh, uh, became a refugee after 1951, the convention was not applicable. This means that the majority of refugees are uh, under the original framing of the convention are those who emerged from the Second World War or immediate post-war crises. Um, and there's also an optional uh, ability for states under the, this early framing of the convention uh, to, to effectively say that they're only going to be concerned with, uh, my, uh, sorry, with refugees from Europe. There's also a territorial or colonial clause that allows for um, colonial empires to say that the convention is not applicable to their colonial territories, which in the early uh, period of a convention in the 1940s and 1950s means that they can opt out, uh, that a significant uh, amount of the world's territory can effectively be opted out of the convention's remit, even if these states opt into it. Um, and there are grandfathered interwar refugee populations, which tended to be Europeans, particularly Russians, something I'm going to touch on um, in a little bit. Um, and on the, on the institutional side, um, there are uh, exceptional uh, other agencies created uh, for Palestinian and Korean refugees, but the early UNHCR is primarily concerned also with Europeans. And of course, you know, I've touched already on the extent to which uh, ISIM is primarily concerned with Europeans, it's suggested in the name, but I think it's instructive also to look at the constitution of ISIM and how this restricted it. Um, so uh, the membership um, was already limited to, to begin with, but new members are limited on, on the basis that they have to be concerned with, so with free movement. And this is intended to, to keep uh, membership of ISIM limited to the Western Bloc, 
of, of states. Um, and then a number of provisions of the ISIM constitution also explicitly are concerned with the fact uh, that ISIM is going to be concerned with uh, emigrants from Europe or, or those who are European. Um, and one of the reasons why both of these regimes were concerned so much with European refugees and migrants was because of the idea that Europe was sort of overflowing with them and that this would create uh, global instability as a result. Um, and this manifests in the idea of the so-called surplus population in Europe. And the idea was um, that certain states in Europe, um, uh, as a consequence of the war, uh, were so overpopulated with people who had fled into them, uh, people who, who had been stranded in them, uh, and needed to be kind of drained of that population. Otherwise, there would be a political reaction that would reprise some of the problems uh, faced during the war itself. Um, despite the fact that those who were making this argument were also kind of cognizant of the idea that uh, this had been a justification previously for, for states kind of expanding, they, they believed that nonetheless, if it were kind of, if, if the concept were kind of brought into the international system and population could be moved around the world on the basis of uh, what international organizations could do as opposed to, to states um, finding their own uh, new or colonial territories, this would be a, a more peaceful means um, to, to alleviate the danger of so-called overpopulation. So it was sort of a blind spot um, in the thinking of some of these people who believed that surplus population would create global uh, instability, uh, that they were only concerned with this kind of problem existing in Europe. Because of course, this kind of problem uh, existed or was beginning to exist elsewhere in the world. And this is, this is where the talk really uh, starts to intersect with, with Hong Kong's history. And I should say, um, in bringing in Hong Kong's history, uh, one thing I'm, I'm not doing is, is making an assertion that um, uh, I am demonstrating uh, original claims about Hong Kong's history. Uh, I'm building on the work of a lot of uh, local Hong Kong historians, a lot of historians also of, of the refugee regime and bringing my, my research into this as well. So um, know that you know, I'm, I'm incorporating this uh, into the discussion. Um, and and I, I understand that this is not only something um, that, that has been tackled by local historians, but is also within the known and lived experience of, of many people in Hong Kong. So I'm trying to simply to relate it to some of the, some of the broader kind of history of, of international and global governance that, that I've begun to talk about earlier in, in the discussion. So um, part of the surplus population issue uh, that affects Hong Kong in the post-war period is the so-called Chinese refugee crisis that's emerging from uh, the Chinese civil war and the economic dislocations uh, of uh, the immediate of the of the wartime and immediate post-war period. So Hong Kong's population, uh, uh, as a result of this, increases dramatically. During the Second World War, Hong Kong's population fell from 1.6 million to 600,000 people, but by one year after the Second World War, had increased again to its pre-war population. Uh, and increases dramatically further after that. So it almost uh, quadruples to, to 4.1 million people by 1971. Um, part of the problem, uh, even if refugee law and UNHCR's work were to have been applied in Hong Kong, uh, is that it was very, very difficult to understand uh, who could fall into um, the specific category of, of refugee under the definition of refugee um, given the number of people who are entering Hong Kong. So UNHCR estimated uh, that maybe 70% of people could claim um, to be uh, refugees under this definition. Um, but it was, it was extremely difficult to tell without the ability to screen everyone who was coming in. Um, and many people were coming in uh, for economic reasons, right? Uh, the, they, they felt that um, their economic future was bleak or were experiencing economic dislocation uh, as a result of, of the, the Civil War and uh, Second World War beforehand, um, and couldn't necessarily claim direct political uh, persecution. Um, as a consequence of uh, the increase in population, there were, were attempts at border control, um, but it couldn't entirely uh, mitigate the crisis. People found their way in very famously, of course, people swimming into uh, Hong Kong, et cetera. Um, and the problem of this population increase is dramatically exacerbated by the outbreak of the Korean War and the subsequent embargo uh, 
on trade with, with uh, the mainland government, um, which had been the basis of a lot of the Hong Kong economy prior to uh, uh, these events um, and required a kind of economic transformation, uh, which um, had not yet taken place at this time. So, so Hong Kong experiences um, a dramatic kind of shakeup of its economic circumstances at the same time that all these people are entering into the city. So uh, as a reflection of the fact that this looks very much like the surplus population problem in Europe, the Hong Kong government in its 19, addresses its 1956 annual report entirely to this issue of uh, so many people entering the colony and they call it a problem of people. They write that a single problem has been very much in our minds for the last 10 years. One can say that there is little that has been done that would not have been done differently in some way uh, if one problem had never existed, finance, education, medical and health services, social welfare, prisons, police, industry, commerce, labor relations, land policy, housing, agriculture and fisheries, political relations, even the law itself, all bear the unmistakable surcharge, in few cases an almost obliterating surcharge, of a single problem. It is the problem of a vast immigrant population. Um, they continue that there were, of course, no homes at all for the great majority of the refugees, and they, they, they sort of blanketly call them all refugees, um, of course, uh, not getting into the question of whether they would uh, be defined as such um, under uh, the Refugee Convention or by UNHCR. Um, all right, serious overcrowding uh, began to build up again very shortly after the Japanese surrender, and by 1950, the pressure of the population was worse than it had ever been in the colony's history. There is still no final solution to this. This terminology of final solution is, is very common in the history of, um, of international migration uh, and refugee law, actually, um, even though, of course, it's, it's sort of tainted by its Second World War associations. This idea that uh, everyone being settled somewhere where they, they sort of uh, belong and are not presenting these kind of overpopulation issues is seen as what the final solution ultimately would need to be. And of course, I couldn't resist kind of throwing in this, this portion of the report that in 1951, an American, of course, I couldn't resist in, in, in kind of context of present day doubt over the future of Hong Kong. In 1951, uh, an American journalist referred to Hong Kong as this dying city and questioned how it could survive with its swollen population and with a great part of its normal trade sacrificed for the general good. Uh, and they, they conclude for the last 10 years, Hong Kong has never lived with such a problem as this relief and jobs and then homes for perhaps as many as a million people. Uh, this, they're writing this in 1956, of course, millions more people will come after a million people who are not here when, when the British rule was reestablished. Um, and the problem of people in Hong Kong is really at its most conspicuous uh, at this time in the form of the so-called squatter settlement. So the city looks very different than it did today as a consequence of so many people coming in uh, and needing housing that does not exist for them. Um, and they established what are effectively shanty towns. So uh, this image is from a, a famous uh, Life magazine report in, in 1962, uh, but it takes ex an extraordinarily long time for Hong Kong to, to integrate this population uh, into kind of uh, more established housing. And so these images at the right uh, come from uh, the 1980s um, when a significant number of people are still located in, in so-called squatter settlements who had um, come in in the, in the earlier post-war period. Um, the middle image is, is from Diamond Hill, of course, looks very dramatically different today. Uh, no squatter settlements there. And the, the far right image is from Kuntong, and it illustrates one of the particular problems with these settlements, which is that they're very prone uh, to, to issues such as fire. Um, and very famously, in Shekit May, there was a, a fire that uh, led the Hong Kong government to resolve to try to build up um, its public housing stock as a result. So, this is just one of the strategies that the, the colonial government uh, took in trying to integrate this population. And they're, they're deeply concerned, like many of those who are deeply concerned about the security of Europe, that if there was not a policy response that could integrate this population, that there would be security issues, that um, crime would increase dramatically result, as a result, that political activism that they found undesirable would increase dramatically as, as a result. So uh, housing, uh, welfare, education, population planning, all of these uh, begin to be brought in uh, to, to Hong Kong government planning in a way that they were not necessarily before. Uh, of course, the, the government and um, nonprofit organizations that are concerned with this population uh, try to propose strategies for the, the population to emigrate. 
uh, to different sort of still extant British colonies um, following in, in the wake of earlier immigrations from Hong Kong to, to um, sort of uh, plantation agriculture settlements in, for example, Malaya um, and other places. Um, but none of these necessarily are, are proven enough. And the Hong Kong government is sort of forced to uh, accede to demands to look to the outside world for assistance naturally to some of these international frameworks that I was discussing earlier, in particular UNHCR. So uh, in 1954, a uh, uh, representative of UNHCR visits Hong Kong um, and concludes, of course, on the basis of um, all of these social dislocations, uh, that emigration uh, and other forms of assistance are, are required. Actually, uh, they begin to be um, somewhat involved in, in some of the planning of moving people to, to other British colonies. Um, but there were some, of course, uh, legal problems with UNHCR's involvement in Hong Kong at the time. So, uh, of course, as I mentioned earlier, um, the UN Refugee Convention uh, was, was time restricted. Um, and so, you know, those who had come into Hong Kong after 1951 were not necessarily uh, included, uh, but uh, didn't really uh, matter given that the UK had used the territorial clause to not apply the convention to Hong Kong at all. Um, of course, both the convention and the UNHCR mandate, which flowed from it, were not applicable to uh, economic migrants. So any of these people who didn't fall into the definition, regardless of whether the convention applied, um, and with regard to UNHCR's mandate, which, which may have still covered these people, um, they may not have fallen then under the mandate. And then finally, there were kind of um, broader questions as to whether or not uh, many of these people could be counted as refugees under the convention or mandate uh, as sort of a, a result of the more specific political issues um, with regard to uh, their, um, their citizenship and um, the fact that uh, they were essentially claimed um, to some extent by both of the, the Chinese successory states. So um, for the PRC, they were not necessarily people who had crossed a border, given that uh, it viewed uh, it, its sovereignty as still extant over Hong Kong. Uh, for the ROC, um, they were seen as potentially those who were still protected um, by much of the rest of the outside world. And so as a result of that, they wouldn't have fallen under the definition of refugee in the convention either. Um, so as a result of all of this, UNHCR and actually ISIM as well are active in Hong Kong, but they're not active in initially in attempting to relieve the situation uh, for Chinese refugees. They're active in attempting to relieve the situation for Europeans who have found themselves in, in China and Hong Kong uh, after the Second World War. And in particular, they're concerned with the so-called white Russian population. Who are they? Well, I mentioned previously that um, earlier refugee populations from the interwar period had been grandfathered into uh, the refugee regime. And one of these populations are the Russians who had left uh, in 1917 as a consequence of the Russian Revolution, many of whom found themselves um, in China after that revolution and who, uh, after 1949, were subsequently uh, attempting to leave, to leave China. And so UNHCR and ISOM, uh, cooperate to try to move these people out of China through Hong Kong, um, through a joint office they established there um, to other parts of the world that, that agree to take them. And I won't read all this text, but essentially what I'm trying to illustrate uh, through this slide is that there was an extraordinary amount of handholding uh, that they engaged in with regard to these people. Um, and just solely when they arrived in Hong Kong, uh, UNHCR and ISIM jointly arranged for transit visas uh, arranged their board and lodging, finalized their visa documentation for the rest of the world, uh, took care of movement arrangements, including the payment of passage, and were responsible for their medical expenses even. Um, so this all stood in extraordinary contrast to basically ignoring the plight of Chinese refugees in Hong Kong, um, that as a consequence of, of some of the, the legal exclusions that existed, they, they were sort of forced um, to do. So how, then were eventually um, Chinese refugees in Hong Kong um, sort of integrated uh, into uh, UNHCR assistance. Well, in 1957, a UN resolution um, allowed UNHCR to sort of expand its mandate um, and allow it to use its good offices to uh, engage uh, 
potentially any, any other, any problem outside of the refugee definition. And this is confirmed by subsequent resolutions um, that come uh, a little bit later in the post-war period. Um, and so UNHCR is able to expand and kind of tackle some of these issues, although uh, as a consequence of, of funding that was, was not really available, much of the relief of the Chinese refugee situation in Hong Kong falls to uh, still the colonial government. Nevertheless, this problem of uh, the, this, um, this good offices solution becomes the basis on which UNHCR activities are able to begin expanding uh, significantly beyond Europeans. So Hong Kong, um, its, its, um, its problems and its situation become the basis on which um, UNHCR is able to be, become involved in many non-European refugee issues. Um, this is pressed forward by uh, new members in the UN, particularly post-colonial uh, Afro-Asiatic states. Um, it culminates in the 1967 refugee protocol for which they, they had advocated. Um, which eliminates the time and geographical biases in the 1951 convention. Um, but good offices um, sort of uh, an ad hoc solution didn't apply to uh, those who fell into the, the migrant category everywhere, who fell out of the refugee definition, but, but could perhaps be seen by migrants everywhere. Um, convention refugee rights still did not extend to them. Um, and non-refugee migrants still couldn't take advantage of, of ICE in this organization that had been established as the kind of uh, effectively equivalent to UNHCR for, for migrants. And one of the reasons for this, of course, is that uh, ISIM is not um, part of the United Nations. And so uh, the new states, the new members that had advocated for UNHCR expansion, um, they couldn't do so within the framework of ISIM. So UN resolutions call on the need for uh, an organization to, to sort of engage in the work that ISIM could have done, but it, it sort of um, deaf to these calls and uh, attempts to expand even from uh, within its membership also kind of fall on, on deaf ears because uh, there's no need for uh, ISIM's member states to agree to this. So in particular, in 1964, uh, Japanese membership is rejected on the basis that effectively allowing an Asian state in will force ISIM to be concerned with all of these Asian migration issues. Um, and, and like some of the fears that existed previously during ISIM's initial creation would lead to a situation in which European states were sort of forced to be more concerned with Asian migration than they would ever originally intended to be. And this attitude, uh, you can see it very clearly in uh, this British response to proposals to expand ISIM's uh, membership and therefore its remit. And here they're saying um, they understand that there is this immense population problem, this problem of surplus population that exists in Japan, India, Pakistan, China. Um, they understand that um, there is a desire and sort of almost, an, almost a natural um, Chinese migration that, it, that exists, but they don't believe and they don't spell out their rationale for this, but they don't believe uh, the international community should be engaged with it. So you can at least, uh, even if the, the, the rationale is not available here, see uh, that there, there's sort of a, a bias against these um, attempts to expand uh, ISIM's remit on the basis of the, the same rationale that existed for Europeans uh, to Asians. There's a bias against that in particular. So who is ISIM concerned with instead? Because uh, as the post-war period progresses, um, of course, uh, Europe recovers economically and there's less and less of a concern about surplus populations in Europe uh, being a security issue there. So instead it becomes concerned with a um, very small discrete number of Europeans uh, who could kind of be used in uh, post-colonial developing states uh, in order to sort of shore up their development and, and uh, ensure that they're uh, kind of cemented into the, the pro-US Western Bloc of which ISIM is uh, an integral part. So um, what's really interesting is uh, these, these are publicity materials for, for ISIM during the period uh, that I found in the Hong Kong Public Records Office. And so ISIM is continually sending the Hong Kong government these materials advertising the fact that it's overwhelmingly concerned with these sort of skilled migrants, perhaps today we would call them um, you know, expats, um, going to Latin America in particular um, and, and attempting to build up Latin American economies. 
um, while at the same time not being particularly concerned with most refugees in Hong Kong. So there's sort of an awareness of the increasing absurdity of this um, within, within ISIM, uh, if not among the member states of ISIM. Uh, and they seize on, internally at least, uh, part of the ISIM constitution that deals in particular with refugees. Um, and it doesn't mention the fact that ISIM needs to be concerned in particular with Europeans. So article three of the ISIM constitution says, the committee shall be concerned with the migration of refugees um, and doesn't mention the fact that they need to be European. So previously, uh, of course, uh, their reading of this clause could be um, done kind of contextually, right? So much of the rest of the constitution demonstrates that ISIM was meant to deal with Europeans, but they look at this in, in this new situation in which it seems like there's so many uh, non-European refugee situations at least, um, and begin to believe that they can construct this clause kind of independently of the rest of the, the constitution and think of the fact that they could at least serve as a kind of refugee agency themselves for non-Europeans. So on this basis, they authorized the Hong Kong office of ISIM to uh, begin to be concerned with non-European refugees. Um, and this manifests in particular with regard to the Vietnamese refugee crisis that uh, begins in the 1970s. So uh, after the fall of Saigon, um, sort of a number of people for both political and economic reasons want to leave Vietnam and many of them left um, on boats uh, trying to arrive in various places in Southeast Asia. And one of those places they uh, attempt to, to move to uh, is Hong Kong for reasons that I'll get into in, in a little bit. But when they arrive in Hong Kong, uh, they're interdicted by the, the police forces um, and moved into, uh, for, to a large extent, into detention camps. And part of the reason for this is that Hong Kong uh, still sees itself as dealing with the ongoing issue of overpopulation from Chinese refugees and migrants. Um, even though they've increased the quota of legal uh, Chinese who could come in uh, by the 1980s, uh, they still see a need to deport a significant number of them um, in order to, to sort of maintain a, a balance of population that they find desirable, um, in order to ensure that they can be housed everyone into squat, uh, who had been in squatter settlements as they, as they pledged to do. And it's still seeing itself as um, a place where this problem of surplus population arises. Uh, the Hong Kong government writing uh, in 1990 when the Vietnamese refugee uh, crisis is still going on, that Hong Kong is one of the most densely populated places in the world. Um, and discussing the fact that this uh, resulted in the fact that they needed to uh, not, not only sort of reject immigrants from elsewhere in the world, but, but even deport Chinese who they saw as um, uh, particularly kind of deserving of, of being located in, in Hong Kong. So what was the result of this? Well, uh, well over 100,000 uh, Vietnamese arrived in Hong Kong uh, between 1975 uh, and 1990. And Hong Kong prided itself on the fact that um, all of them were allowed to, to enter as opposed to being pushed away as, as they were from numerous Southeast Asian states. Um, so to some extent, um, they defended this policy on the basis that it was a humanitarian, that it was a humanitarian one. Um, however, of course, uh, this incentivized many migrants to try to make it to uh, Hong Kong as opposed to other destinations. So uh, as a result, it adopts a policy of so-called humane deterrence, and this is part of why uh, detention camps are opted for. Um, as a, as a means to kind of hold the Vietnamese population that's coming in as they await kind of resettlement elsewhere, which is the strategy for uh, ensuring that they don't add to the Hong Kong population problem. Um, as this uh, uh, pressure mounts on, on Hong Kong, and particularly um, by the late 1980s, there's a concern that a larger number of Vietnamese who are coming into Hong Kong are not political refugees, right, under the definition um, in, the, in, uh, in the 1951 Refugee Convention, uh, which is adhered to for the purposes of, of this influx, uh, but are, are potentially um, economic migrants. And so essentially uh, Hong Kong adopts a very strict policy of screening out, attempting to screen out those who uh, are potentially not those who fall under uh, the definition of, of refugee under the convention. 
So anyone who could be presumed to be an economic migrant, um, and many of these are forcibly then deported back to, to Vietnam. Um, those who are not relative minority, they can be resettled by UNHCR uh, and by ISIM, who uh, together again sort of engage uh, with this population. Um, so um, what you can see is that um, because ISIM adopted this, this kind of policy that uh, uh, allowed it to operate on the four non-Europeans uh, who are refugees, it becomes a kind of adjutant of UNHCR. And so we have a kind of global um, uh, system of institutions that are able to, to handle um, refugees but those who are considered to be economic migrants are sort of out of luck under this policy. And I should say, this is also the period of course when uh, human rights advocacy begins to come in, although it's in its infancy. Um, and a majority of challenges actually that are made against the detention policy in Hong Kong, it's not human rights that are the decisive factor, but in course, but, but habeas corpus, right? So common, the common law writ uh, that allows for, um, for many of these people to, to escape Attention if they're able to. So um, this is really one of the marquee uh, situations in which ISIM um, proclaims itself to be a kind of refugee and humanitarian agency. Uh, they're involved uh, in many other sort of situations throughout the, the later um, post-war Cold War era right, in India, Pakistan, with their war in Uganda in, in uh, South America and Cuba um, in engaging as primarily a refugee agency. Uh, and by 1974, already 90% of those assisted by ISIM were statutory refugees. Um, and it was essentially in, in doing so, assisting UNHCR in being a refugee agency itself. Um, there is one notable and interesting exception to this, which is uh, the so-called orderly departure program from Vietnam which was attempted to be a kind of end run around uh, the need for Vietnamese to depart Vietnam. So UNHCR and ISIM set up this program where even if you're not a statutory refugee, even if you solely want to leave Vietnam for economic reasons, uh, they will facilitate that. And it's sort of done on the, uh, on the basis of a, a fudge where UNHCR expanded the concept of good offices further than many people in the organization ever wanted it to go. And um, ISIM is only kind of involved in a subsidiary basis. So uh, it, it, the, the problem uh, with uh, its handling of, of non-European migrants is um, until very late in the program when this is alleviated by constitutional changes in ISIM, not an issue. But this only lasts uh, for a relatively short period of time. Um, uh, the program is kind of ended uh, because of Vietnamese suspicion. Um, of how it's being handled. Uh, and as, as a result of its ending, uh, Hong Kong uh, receives one of the larger influxes of, of Vietnamese, which subsequently um, is what leads to kind of the, the harsh policy of discrimination uh, that I was just talking about. But, it's, but the order of the departure program is an interesting window into sort of um, you know, what ISIM could have done to sort of facilitate uh, and sort of oversee uh, migration uh, beyond those who fall under the definition of refugee. So, what I'm what I've sort of trying to been what I've been trying to illustrate, right, is the fact that uh, in these shifts that can be demonstrated through the history of migration, refugee crises in Hong Kong, um, non-European migrants, those who don't fall under any conceivable definition of refugee, are those who are kind of left behind, right. So um, the, the Refugee Convention um, doesn't necessarily provide for them. The, the, the definition can be stretched to some extent, but not for everyone. Um, UNHCR sometimes can provide for them through its mandate, sometimes through the concept of, of good offices, uh, but doesn't always. Um, there are, of course, uh, international conventions concerned with, with migrants. They tend to be uh, relatively poorly ratified and followed. And part of that is that there's no organization like UNHCR to kind of monitor and oversee their implementation. Um, uh, ISIM becomes uh, uh, today 
uh, IOM. And uh, as I've sort of illustrated, it's primarily concerned uh, mostly with kind of humanitarian emergencies still it's to this day. Uh, and so they relatively rarely assist those who don't fall uh, under the definition in some way of, of refugee. And of course, there are other international uh, agencies and organizations that are concerned with uh, non-European migrants or con they're concerned with migrants overall, uh, but because of kind of uh, the fact that it's not their, their specific competency, they're often sort of at odds with IOM. So um, as I kind of alluded uh, previously, ISIM formally shifts its profile um, through the 1980s. Eventually uh, by 1989, the constitution is finally amended uh, to allow it to be concerned with uh, non-Europeans overall. But by this point, it had kind of shifted dramatically to become uh, principally an agency concerned with refugee and humanitarian problems. Um, currently, a, a considerable amount of the IOM budget uh, is concerned with, with, with these emergencies. And there's been an attempt to kind of bring it further into the UN. You may have seen the fact that it's kind of rebranded itself uh, as, UN as UN migration or the UN migration agency. Uh, but this is sort of more superficial than actual in terms of uh, how uh, it's sort of integrated into the UN system. So there, there are lots of kind of issues with that integration. And it's still um, an organization, even though it's expanded its membership, uh, that's principally concerned with the desires and needs of member states. So it's not overseen by the General Assembly in the same way that UNHCR is. Uh, but responds to its principal funders in a way that's led it to be more concerned uh, with border control as a means of migration management and control and sort of serving as a consultant for their border control needs than with facilitating uh, the needs of, of migrants themselves. So as a consequence of this, we really get two regimes that focus principally on refugees and humanitarian situations, um, leaving out, as I mentioned before, uh, those who could, uh, who, who could be seen as, as uh, mere migrants alone. And as a consequence of that, many, many people who uh, would normally fall under this category or who, who um, uh, could be perceived as falling under the category of economic migrant, try to find a way to uh, be seen as refugees, which places a dramatic kind of pressure on the refugee system as they kind of stretch that definition and potentially delegitimate it, right? So you hear, you hear in political rhetoric, of course, many people today saying, um, you know, these are not real refugees, these are economic migrants, um, uh, which potentially delegitimates the refugee system for all of those who are concerned with, with using it. Um, and part of what I argue is this is a consequence of not having uh, of, uh, an effective system of governance for those who uh, would fall under the, the migrant category uh, who could potentially uh, be engaged with that uh, more directly. And I just wanna end on this note, this was kind of already envisaged in 1957, um, you know, during kind of the first crisis that I was talking about in Hong Kong um, by the Brookings Institution, by the think tank in a footnote. So they don't necessarily see this as incredibly important, but they can kind of see where it's going, even at the time. And they write that the emphasis of the international community on European migrants is significant. During the early, uh, during the 19th and early 20th centuries, organized migration was viewed by the Western world primarily as a European problem, and scant attention was paid to migrant movements in other parts of the world. This tradition left its imprint on international organizations interested in migration um, and left them equipped to render um, sorry, left them ill-equipped to render effective assistance in meeting the problems of non-European migrants, particularly those from Asia and the Far East. Little assistance other than emergency aid is given to European migrants. And of course, this problem, um, as I've argued, continues to haunt the international system today. And so I hope that uh, this talk, illustrating it through the history of Hong Kong, uh, has, has um, uh, sort of um, helps to demonstrate this as well. So thanks to everyone for listening this entire time. And uh, I really look forward to any questions that you might have. Okay, thanks. Thanks so much, uh, Chris, for an incredibly uh, stimulating and, and wide ranging talk. There are so many um, different issues and threads and interesting sort of connections and, and ways that things developed that could have been uh, different. I, you know, 
I'm I'm already struggling sort of to to narrow down my questions rather than than come up with them. Um, so I'll 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 take a traditional prerogative and and pose a, a a couple in a moment. But let me also just take this opportunity to say to the audience, you know, um, feel free to to um, send in uh, uh, any questions uh, you might have uh, or otherwise uh, uh, message me now. Um, so so to get us started, I guess. Um, uh, maybe a, a pair of questions um, uh, from me. So the first, the first one, actually, just going back to the to, to where you started, kind of in the post World War II period. You noted, of course, there was a pre a, a pre World War II kind of regime as well. So I was just wondering if you could and and um, uh, and you mentioned sort of the ILOs kind of connection to all of these things and and hinted that you know that. And, and as you said, sort of, we tend to think about things in a more human rights context now because that's become familiar much more recently, but there was a different mode of thinking, I, I think at that point in time. So maybe you could um, um, unpack a little bit exact or, or explain for everyone a little bit more exactly how the, you know, um, how we should think about the pre-World War II ways of thinking about these issues. Um, and also, you know, to what extent did, did World War II change things? And also, I guess more, more specifically, maybe as well in the context of a place like, you know, a place within the British Empire, um, how was uh, UNHCR and its new involvement in refugee law? What, in what ways did that change um, pre-existing sort of legal approaches to questions around who can be removed or not, et cetera, kind of what obligations are due people versus you know, or how is it understood to, to change things versus um, a mirror existing regimes? Um, and then there's a, a, a totally different question from a, from a later moment in what you covered. Um, so, and sort of on the, because um, there's this, this whole kind of international ways of thinking about migration side of things. And then there's also the sort of the way that the, inter, the, the different organizations of the, the international system evolve and interrelate. Uh, so what you know, so 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 uh, as you brought out, right? It's quite interesting that sort of UNHCR and then and then I, ICEM develop as totally different things, but then but then come into relationship to one another. So I guess to to put a concrete point on it, why was it that ICEM ended up and then IOM ended up assisting UNHCR with certain issues rather than UNHCR just itself kind of expanding and and doing all of that in house. Uh, so I'll, I'll turn over the floor to you and, and again, encourage the audience to uh, send me uh, any questions you might have. Uh, okay, um, so uh, you know, the first question on, on interwar and how, how things change, right? So it's, I think it's interesting because um, I think that there's an attempt to kind of change the paradigm um, after the Second World War, uh, but there's kind of a backtracking on that. And so uh, just to illustrate, right? So I mentioned that the, the paradigm of um, kind of refugee law and, and governance in the interwar period really has to do with designating specific national groups as refugees. So the Russian Revolution happens. Um, many Russians right, leave because they fear persecution as a result of, of being on the wrong side of the, the Bolshevik uh, regime. Um, and so Russians are designated as, as refugees as a consequence. They're seen as um, lacking state protection as a result of the revolution. Um, effectively being stateless, their passports don't work anymore because they say Imperial Russia and not Soviet Union on them. Um, all of these issues. And so um, this also comes up for a number of minorities in the, the Ottoman Empire, for example, Armenians who had been kind of um, subject to, to, to all kinds of, of, of course, uh, persecution uh, during the war and a number of other minority groups uh, in the Ottoman state as well. Um, and uh, there was a, an international refugee kind of organization which changes names and, and paradigms every kind of few years during the interwar period because often these refugee crises are seen as being temporary even though they tend to stretch on and on and on. So um, after the Second World War, uh, even though there is still this mentality that refugee crises um, will tend to be temporary and a hope that the final solution that I kind of mentioned earlier would materialize, um, there is also an attempt to kind of put uh, refugee law and governance on a slightly more permanent basis. And this is why you see an attempt to kind of frame, at least in terms of how it's phrased, you know, regardless of the kind of um, uh, 
uh, uh, parts of the convention that, that exclude non-Europeans, at least in terms of how the definition itself is phrased, try to be universal, right? Try to not be solely focused on, on these groups. Uh, but then it's found that there are situations, right? Like the situation in, in Hong Kong in which it's difficult to um, discriminate between those who leave for economic reasons and, and want to sort of include them in the category of refugee. Um, and so here you get as a consequence, as I mentioned, the um, kind of invention of the concept of good offices. And because the concept of good offices can be invoked in different situations and expanded, I think in some ways it kind of mirrors the interwar situation, right? So UNHCR can say, there's a situation in this place. Um, these kinds of people who are leaving this place, um, this, this nationality, this group, um, they uh, will be designated refugees for the purposes of our aid, even though the convention um, doesn't apply to them, for the purposes of UNHCR aid, uh, we will designate them refugees and, and take care of them, essentially. Um, and you also see this in, in other multilateral for us. So I didn't want to take too much time um, discussing this, but you know, uh, the situation with Vietnamese. So initially, um, the, the forms of discrimination between uh, economic migrant and, and refugee were not applied in the same way uh, because there was an international conference in 1979 in which it was decided that blanketly anyone who uh, was Vietnamese leaving Vietnam could be considered a refugee, right? So it very much mirrors this interwar paradigm of how to think about who a refugee is, right? Designating specific national groups because of specific crises. Um, and it kind of maybe um, highlights ways in which uh, the refugee definition um, doesn't necessarily work in terms of how we think about refugee and migration crises, right? Maybe the interwar um, uh, paradigm of how to think about them uh, match it, mirrors more closely how um, international politics tends to conceive of these, these situations. So your second question is about, you know, why, why did UNHCR not expand and just as a consequence of this, you know, deal with you know, any, any you know, person who finds themselves in a kind of migratory situation. I'm, I don't know if that um, is a good uh, paraphrase of, of what you were asking. Um, yeah, okay. Um, so, I mean, I think that part of it is, is, right, this attempt to retain some feature of discrimination between the refugee and the migrant, because um, there's always with um, both of these um, systems, uh, this understanding that states are going to be more responsive to the relatively smaller um, group of refugees with a more acute humanitarian need. So if UNHCR were to expand, um, and if refugee law were to expand entirely uh, to sort of deal with everyone in a migratory situation, it would lose that ability to say, you know, these are not just you know, everyday migrants, these are people in particular need of assistance. And so I think that it, it works better for UNHCR to be able to um, maintain some form of uh, narrow definition, but at times when they feel like it's necessary, be able to expand it essentially. Um, and, you know, and as for you know what ISOM winds up doing, I mean, this is essentially my critique that um, you know even though ISOM tends to take on you know specific roles within its assistance for um, these humanitarian situations that it's essentially kind of reduplicating what UNHCR could do in those situations. And instead, you know, as IOM, I, I think that, you know, it would be uh, more useful potentially to be an agency principally concerned with the needs of migrants and arranging, you know, specific pathways for them to move, advocating for their rights on the basis of uh, those conventions that, that do exist that tend to be uh, relatively ignored compared to the refugee convention. Right, very, very, uh, very interesting. I might, I might follow up on some of those themes, but first I have some um, questions from uh, members of the audience as well. Um, so I'll give you a couple. Um, so the first one um, is, um, what is the present humanitarian assistance regime, if any, to African refugees going to Europe, especially in light of, you know, the, the what we all know about, um, uh, loss of life on, on the seas along the way. And maybe if, if I can kind of broaden that one as well, sort of how does that component of, you know, not within sort of in, in transit itself and all of the harm that can happen there, I guess, especially on the sea, 
sort of if there's any um, uh, relationship of that to, to the themes you were discussing as well. Um, and the second question is, uh, what happens to those who are not recognized as refugees, um, uh, who, who, who were not recognized as refugees from Vietnam, who were repatriated back to Vietnam? Did they receive any protection from international organizations after being uh, sent back? Thanks. Um, so, so the question of you know, Africans coming to Europe, this is obviously something that um, uh, isn't in, that, that falls within the implications of everything that I've discussed. Although to discuss um, how exactly it would probably require a whole, you know, separate one hour, hour discussion. Um, I'll just say, you know, the, the danger that these people face um, in trying to reach Europe, uh, for example, um, is something that I think um, would be alleviated if you know, there were the ability to have an organization that were concerned with overseeing these pathways and overseeing their safety uh, more specifically. Um, and the other issue there, though, um, is, is related to what I was talking about in terms of um, trying to fall under the definition of refugee, because often um, those who arrive in, in Europe, not just from Africa, but, but elsewhere, are those that are attempting this. And they may not even realize, you know, by the time they when, when they do arrive in Europe, that um, this is the option available to them. But often their lawyers will assist them in this process and say, we can we can try to make out a claim that, you know, whatever, however you left, whatever reason you left uh, your home country for was a form of persecution, right? And so this potentially stretches the definition of persecution very far and potentially leads to its delegitimation politically, right? And leads to the situation where a lot of uh, people in Europe are, are potentially in objection to um, uh, greater influx of people from, from elsewhere on this basis. They're saying, look, the, the refugee regime is a Trojan horse. It allows everyone to come in. And it, it, um, you know, we're just admitting all of these people who are not real refugees. And so the consequence may be you know, that, that countries are not, um, the countries don't then follow up on their obligations to, to, uh, to refugees entirely, right, as a consequence, because they see it as a regime that's just you know, not as discriminatory as they would prefer. OK. So um, the second question, and you know, I, I can come back to the, to the question of, of uh, Europe and, and migration. There's a lot to talk about there. But the second question, just to get to it um, for now, on repatriated Vietnamese, of course, you know, this is incredibly controversial, right? Um, there, there are you know, claims in some of the literature from this period that you know, people sent back, um, you know, they, they were not, in fact, uh, mere economic migrants. And so as a consequence, uh, they had been people who had been persecuted or who were in danger of persecution because it's actually the, the definition requires a well-founded fear, not actual persecution having taken place. So if you're you know, a minority population, part of a minority population, uh, part of a minority group, for example, um, you can be counted under that definition. So um, often there are allegations that um, you know, the screening process in Hong Kong uh, was not particularly robust, that they found any excuse um, you know, to, to send someone back to Vietnam. Uh, and as a consequence, a lot of people who should have been counted um, as, uh, um, as, as true refugees under this, under this system, under this screening process, uh, wound up back in Vietnam and, and were in fact uh, persecuted in various ways uh, by, the, by the government at the time. Um, and you know, of course, you know, as I mentioned, this is the period of sort of incipient uh, human rights monitoring and, and concern, uh, but there wasn't um, very much that's, that many of these organizations uh, could, could in fact do um, to assist these people. Uh, part of the reason being, of course, that you know, ties between Vietnam and, and many Western states, um, particularly you know, just after the Vietnam War in the 1980s, uh, were still a little bit strained. Um, so uh, you know, this, was, this was a difficult situation for those people, particularly if they, they did fall into this category of, of those who could uh, subsequently be persecuted. Okay, um, uh, uh, fantastic. So um, uh, to follow up on something sort of, I think related to um, uh, uh, both of your sets of answers in a way. So, so one really interesting thing um, uh, or, or one thing that was standing out to me in the course of, of your talk was for both UNHCR and uh, ICEM, 
you know, you walk through different sort of sort of a timeline where different states are relating to them, and it was it was often hard to know what those states' attitudes would be, and and I was sort of understanding that um, in my head, I guess, based on you know, or, or sort of just listening to your talk, thinking, okay, well, that makes sense in so far as on the one hand, relative to both those organizations, states might think oh, we really want this. This will help us with some big problem we're dealing with, like a, a refugee population we have. And on the other hand, relative to both of them, states might think, oh, no, we really don't want this thing because this is going to come with legal obligations that we have to do certain things. We're going to have less sovereignty, less control over our migration policy, um, uh, et cetera. Um, and I guess sort of it seems like, you know, I, I guess if you... Um, uh, there's kind of a pressure on those organizations themselves over time to write, to be accepted, to emphasize the, huma the humanitarian assistance side of things, maybe the, you know, protection side, do what you can, um, it, it, it sort of diminishes. But I wonder what, you know, if you, um, I guess I wonder if you could just reflect on those, on those themes, the sort of the way I'm thinking about it make sense to you or is that how how you th think about them do you think they have uh, or uh is that tension is that the way you understand states think about it is that the way you understand sort of a, a factor that you see shaping the way that these institutions themselves evolve over time and maybe to connect that because you know like i think sort of as i understood it you concluded with, uh, um uh, in in significant part with the regime as it exists is is somewhat problematic because they're because of this lack right that this lack of a migration related protection regimes especially you know out, outside of Europe uh, for example um, uh, and in part that seems to be a product of right these you know it, so I guess it's also a question of to what extent was that you know has that been produced by Cont, you know, contingent historical factors, just the way that things evolved over time versus to what extent was it structurally built in in that, you know, that's precisely what um, you know, states are just really keen consistently on having control over borders, migration, uh, etc. Right, so um, a couple, a couple com complicated questions. I think, you know, the first thread I'll pull out of that, right, is um, the question of, you know, to what extent is this about states? To what extent is it about maybe the internal logic of, of organizations? Um, so I think you see um, there's a moment, right? When um, I, was, I was discussing the um, interpretation of the ISIN constitution, that states at the same time, they, they were very concerned to keep out um, the influence of, of you know, other non-European states or to, to prevent the organization from expanding. Um, at the same time, internally, ISIM kind of was beginning to see itself as kind of an organization that could fulfill kind of humanitarian needs, particularly uh, outside of Europe. And this is how they hit on this definition of, you know, um, it's uh, sorry, how they hit on this interpretation of the ISIM constitution as being able at least to assist non-European refugees, right? Um, but, you know, then the issue is this. Um, states had to, had to kind of Exceed to that, right? They ultimately have control over ISIM. So I think you're right to point to the fact there's a complex dynamic because they at least had to agree then that this was, you know, how ISIM should evolve as an institution. They at least had to understand that, you know, there was this increasing absurdity of ISIM not being able to engage with non Europeans um, and to at least allow it then to um, expand to certain non Europeans, namely, you know, those who could be defined as, as a refugee. So there's, there can be a complex kind of interplay between states and organizations. I think you know another I'll give you another example, which is you know the the expansion of ISIM's remit, and you know part of part of it I said of, of course was a consequence of new members of the UN, post-colonial states, coming in and saying you know it's absurd that we have this organization that's not concerned with refugees um, from our territories um, or you know in the rest of the world, right? So it's just sort of ideologically considering. Um, you know, the necessity of an organization to deal with, with non-Europeans. Um, but there are um, other histories that point to internally, you know, the, um, the high commissioners themselves driving some of this change. So um, in, in pointing to some of the ways in which the states push this, 
I'm kind of pushing back at some of that internalist history, actually, um, which I see as kind of coming a little bit too much from the center and kind of lionizing these great men, high commissioners, um, you know, for, for having the sudden realization in the 1960s that it was, you know, the organization was being biased against uh, non-Europeans. But it's another example of coming from a different direction then of, you know, how there's a kind of push-pull between states um, and their interests. I'll give you another example of um, the kind of uh, complexity of states' interests, though, which um, is actually something that can be illustrated through, through Hong Kong history. Um, so the initial resolution um, in uh, 1957 on Chinese refugees in Hong Kong, um, there's been certain, there's been some debate over where this originates. Um, and there are histories that say, for example, uh, this was pushed entirely by the ROC government. They wanted to highlight the issue of uh, Chinese refugees in Hong Kong. Uh, there are other histories, though, uh, that note the way that um, the ROC government definitely didn't want to highlight this issue too much because it would have placed pressure on them um, to serve potentially as the protector of these people, right? Um, as, as I kind of mentioned, because they could potentially not be seen as refugees, but those who fall under the protection or claim of, of the ROC. So um, it was a really, I think, complex intersection of the ROC wanting to highlight to some extent uh, the existence of this population, sort of for propaganda reasons, but also um, there's, there's a kind of third actor to point to here, which is um, NGOs and humanitarian organizations that exist you know, outside of uh, the kind of uh, uh, public international law world, right? So private organizations, uh, especially religious organizations in Hong Kong, they were placing a lot of pressure uh, both on, bo both, um, you know, on the colonial government and within uh, the UN on other states themselves. Um, in order to uh, have this resolution be adopted. So um, really, you know, states can have multiple interests. Um, uh, organizations can have interests internally, uh, and there can be other actors who um, can, uh, can be involved um, in these processes. Um, and so we have to take them all into account. So I hope that answers the sort of methodological historical questions that I think you're, you're, you're sort of attempting to get at. Um, and I think you, know, you asked a kind of broader question about um, structure uh, and contingency. Uh, and of course, I think you know, they, both, they both play a role to a certain extent, right? So um, to a certain extent, like this whole story is about um, decolonization and greater power of um, you know, post-colonial states and in, in international organizations and um, structural pressure you know, in various different ways from organizations, from the media, et cetera, to be concerned with uh, non-European peoples. But at the same time, you, you can find all kinds of of contingencies um, that you know, potentially lead to the way that uh, this history develops. So uh, when there was the initial split between the refugee uh, and migration kind of regimes in the 1950s, um, you know, that I think kind of manifests with uh, one being concerned with uh, non-European populations earlier than the other in ways that, I, I, of course, they are consequential. Uh, one of the reasons for this, one of the reasons why there's no uh, larger uh, migration organization. And why the U.S. took a different position? You know, part of it might have been this issue of okay, the you know the Soviet Union uh, would have been uh, concerned with. Um, you know, with migration policy globally, right? Which is something that I mentioned. But there are kind of more um, specific contingent reasons at the time why they were willing to fund a UN refugee organization, but not a similar organization for, for migrants. And, you know, if, if you look closely, I mean, uh, one of the issues was during the Truman administration, um, uh, there was more support for um, kind of large international initiatives earlier in, uh, uh, Truman's period in office, and there was growing fatigue with that. So um, UNHCR comes first. Um, there's buy-in for it in Congress, in the Republican Congress, that um, uh, Truman needed uh, to support his budget. But uh, when it came to uh, the creation of a potential international migration administration linked to the ILO, which was the initial proposal, um, they kind of balk at this. And it's not just because um, you know, they're, they're worried about Soviet influence. But I think it's also clear that it's because 
they're sick of spending so much money on the international system and they want to kind of retreat to uh, the kind of so-called normalcy, right? This kind of uh, US, uh, slightly more isolationist traditional US position um, that uh, they critique Truman from going a little bit too far beyond. So I, I think you can find all kinds of contingent reasons. That's just one example, but I'll, I'll leave it at that. Hopefully, <laughs> I don't want to take up too much time. So hopefully there are other questions maybe I can address. Yeah, super, I mean, uh, that's, that's super, uh, super, super interesting. Um, uh, so may, maybe um, actually uh, I'll um, ask a, a related question to that as well as a few sort of um, uh, a combination of kind of historically um, specific questions in a way. So, so the related question of course is, okay, so the US is the force which is resisting in the 50s an ILO linked international migration organization like, like UNHCR or, or regime or, or, or what have you. Um, what, what about, um, um, uh, can, can you say more also about the kind of, the fact that European empire was still so much of a thing in that same period and, and also, and then specifically, I guess also kind of how, um, cause it's, it's Europe, it's the US, but it's also sort of, when what when when UNHCR is in Hong Kong in that period, they're in, you know interacting with the, the British colonial government. How do you know what's the and as you said, like uh, um, as with so many of the post World War II treaties that were passed, there's a, a clause or even um, you know the 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 ILO the various ILO treaties earlier. There's a clause that says you know for imperial territories, this you can choose whether or not to, to accept this, like with the European Convention of, of Human Rights uh, as well, for example. Um, so how did that, you know, so how did the, um, uh, the sort of existence still of big European empires in that, in that initial period, did that play a role in shaping things as well? Um, and then I had, uh, um, maybe I'll just ask that one first, and then I have three sort of specific kind of temporality questions I want to ask. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, I, I would say that it slightly less to do with, um, with, with empire than an attempt to kind of uh, continue to ground um, sort of um, overall concern with, um, you know, the position of, of Europe in the international system. So um, uh, with, with the situation where, for example, um, you know, ISIM is created instead of a broader uh, international migration, organization at the time, there are coalitions of European states um, essentially, you know, kind of just concerned with, you know, is this going to be an expensive international organization that is going to focus on migration situations that, that we're not concerned with and that we don't necessarily find desirable, right? So this has less to do with, with formal empire than it has to do with who has the power in the international system no, with, with their understanding that they're entering kind of a period of decolonization in which uh, that would be you know, potentially, potentially lacking. Um, you know, that having been said, there are situations, um, particularly with regard to you know, how the um, application of, uh, for example, the UNHCR mandate evolves in which formal empire is very much um, you know, on the table as a consideration. So for example, the, the Algerian war um, France is deeply concerned with um, the extent to which UNHCR can render assistance to Algerian refugees. Why? Because they think that many of the, the so-called refugees are actually um, uh, FLN rebels um, and that UNHCR is effectively supporting them in territories outside of Algeria, right? So in, in some of these wars of decolonization, there's a skepticism coming from um, the formal imperial powers that uh, humanitarian organizations are, are necessarily a good thing to have kind of on the, on the ground. Um, and France becomes a, you know, a real bugbear for the expansion of both of these, both of these organizations you know, for, for, for both that reason and because they're concerned with uh, the immigration of, of non-Europeans. So um, but, you know, that's, that's, a, that's a big thing. Um, what about, um, you know, where, does, where does Hong Kong uh, fit in with all this? And I think if to some extent Hong Kong here is sui generis, but um, maybe structurally you can see it kind of um, as a, a place, you know, it's, it's a formal colony that's surviving in a world in which the British Empire is losing a lot of its power to kind of direct the dynamics of, of the world as a whole. So it's in an increasingly precarious position. Um, and the British colonial government in Hong Kong, it needs to be remembered, um, always saw itself in this position 
where if it were too deeply involved in intra-Chinese politics, it could be uh, in grave danger, right? So they're, they're very concerned with any time that, you know, the nationalist government brings up, you know, the rights of refugees in Hong Kong, because they see that as, as something uh, that allows Hong Kong to be a kind of battleground between that government and, and Beijing, for example. And they're also concerned with, you know, what is Beijing's response to this going to be? They're also concerned potentially, you know, with the, you know, how, how um, uh, refugees are cared for in Hong Kong on the basis that, you know, uh, a potential response that Beijing, you know, wasn't looking for could be um, a basis for intervention by Beijing, right? So um, here you have a situation where, you know, the, the fate of the colony really feels like it's, it's not in, in entirely in their hands. And um, kind of a consequence of this is that always um, they're thinking of um, how, how uh, the response to, to refugees and migrants is both by them and by the international community relates to um, some of these local, um, you should, I, I would call it, you know, it's, it's not post-colonial, but post, you know, um, Eurocentric world order dynamics. Mm, yeah, very, uh, very interesting. Uh, thank you. Um, okay, so well, let me also uh, invite um, uh, audience members if they have any uh, further uh, questions, uh, send those um, into me as we're um, uh, coming into coming towards conclusion. Um, but let me pose also. Uh, so there's three. There, there were three different specific things that you mentioned that kind of. Um, sort of ways that these debates were, were framed that you, and, and I think you pointed to sort of the archival sources for several of them that had a lot of contemporary resonance. So one was, the, uh, uh, I mean, as, as you pointed out, the final solution carries World War II overtones, but sort of as, as you noted that idea of we have this population, this immigration problem, we need to resolve it once and for all sort of. Uh, one was the idea of humane deterrence um, uh, and one was the distinction between refugees and economic migrants, all of which, you know, you can see still uh, playing out in, in, in many different places, uh, I think, today. Um, so my so I guess my question was, um, you know, were, and this is um, potentially drawing on the fact that I know you have even more extensive knowledge than what you presented today, but are those, are all of those framings existing prior to the Second World War as well? Or are they, you know, or, or are some of them things which arise in, in this period that you were discussing? Okay, um, so uh, with regard to the, the final solution question, I think is definitely there. Um, you, you see, you know, as I mentioned, um, there's a constant attempt to, to so-called solve the refugee problem, right? And it's, it, in this, you know, in the interwar period, the, the League of Nations is constantly um, sort of uh, sending inquiries to their refugee organization. Why haven't you solved this yet? Why isn't it over? This is a post-war situation. The war, the, there was, this was the war to end wars. Why haven't you cleaned up the, the kind of results of it yet? Uh, and so this idea that there could be an end to refugees is, is present, um, you know, both before and of course, as I mentioned, after uh, the war. Um, but I, I think that increasingly there's an attempt or an understanding that um, you know, this is not going to be something that goes away forever. This is going to be a persistent situation. You see that with sort of um, early in the history of UNHCR, you know, there had been debates over, should we wind up UNHCR? Because it's you know, the, the, the problems of, the final problems of the second world war um, you know, have sort of dissipated a little bit more um, around the mid 1950s. Um, and once again, you get a kind of debate over whether um, this is kind of the end of the, the so-called refugee question. But I, by that time, I think there's more um, perception of a need for an ongoing response uh, to the refugee situation. And you mentioned, I, I think the second one was, was humane deterrence. Yeah, I mean, I think that um, this idea of um, incarceration, I mean, to some extent you see, um, uh, for example, after the First World War um, and in, in other situations, like after the second, you see, uh, for example, camps um, and other things that are used, have been used for other purposes, used to hold refugees and to process them, et cetera. But this idea that uh, detention would be a, a deterrent, um, 
to some extent, it, it seems like it's really innovated, right? In in this um, in in the situation in, in Hong Kong with uh, the Vietnamese, and I think part of that is the relative novelty of you know Hong Kong, as I mentioned, felt like it hadn't dealt with the original refugee crisis uh, of the post-war period. It felt like it was it had, it had finally kind of been uh, in the process of of, of finalizing its. Um, attempt to deal with it. And then they get this new crisis, right? And so they, there's kind of almost a, an overreaction as a consequence um, that leads to this um, understanding that there needs to be a means to uh, kind of um, prevent uh, others from, from arriving, particularly those. And I mean, this was, this was less the case early in the Vietnamese refugee crisis when some of the Vietnamese coming were actually ethnic Chinese or Cantonese speaking. Etc. But later on, you know, they're seen as these are not co-ethnics. They don't belong in, in Hong Kong, and we need to make sure that they they don't take advantage of. And this is, of course, also a consequence of um, the original extension of Hong Kong's policy of not um, of, of not pursuing pushbacks against them. That they don't take advantage of this humanitarianism that Hong Kong saw itself as, as offering. So it's also kind of a, a consequence of Hong Kong's self belief that um, it's particularly humanitarian. Um, in being welcoming to these people, but not wanting necessarily to have all of them uh, arrive. And so, I, um, I'm sorry, the third, what was the last one you mentioned? And the third one was the economic migrant refugee. Right, so this is, um, this is something that, that's persistent, you know, throughout the history of, of refugee uh, migration governance at the, the international level. But one thing that's really striking is um, that in the interwar period, in the immediate post-war period, um, when there was this concern with European surplus populations, the economic migrant was held up as an incredibly desirable um, person to have, uh, particularly in, in Latin American states and later Australia. All these states wanted to increase their population of, of Europeans. They believed this would um, have economic benefits. They believed this would assist their development. Um, and then one of the things, and one of the things you see uh, dramatically shift. Um, as a consequence of move toward mass migration being principally non-European, is that this figure of the economic migrant is increasingly vilified. So this is actually something um, that that moves. Um, and you know, the idea that the refugee was is more desirable uh, is is uh, potentially a kind of um, you know more modern innovation that um, th that these people are seen as more deserving. In, in the interwar period, it, to some extent, this was the complete opposite. That these people were seen as uh, potentially not contributory in an economic way and therefore not desirable to have. So it's very much colored, I think, by this racial dynamic um, uh, in the post-war era. Okay, well, uh, uh, absolutely. Uh, thanks so much for your answers and, and to, to those questions and, and to all of the questions. Uh, it's been uh, absolutely fascinating um, throughout. I think, uh, again, as I said at the beginning, there are so many different kind of aspects and themes and, and interrelationships. And as you noted in your answers, kind of the different, there, there are so many different sort of sources of agency that are interrelating. Um, uh, uh, it's incredibly uh, interesting stuff. Um, so uh, it just uh, falls for me since we're uh, reaching the end of our um, time to um, thank you um, so much, uh, Chris, for that uh, amazing talk. I'm sure the audience will all, uh, of course, we won't be able to hear them, uh, but I'm sure they'll all join with me in extending their uh, appreciation um, uh, for the talk uh, as well.